Hello everyone. In this video we're going to begin our discussion of probabilistic analysis. We're going to start by trying to understand what is our goal for using this. Somewhere in Foundations 1 you likely mentioned a couple of ideas, which were the best case runtime and the worst case runtime. It's also possible you mentioned the expected case, but didn't do anything with it because we didn't have the right mathematical tools to analyze it. So our primary focus when we talk about probabilistic analysis is trying to understand what do we mean by expected case, and in the process we'll get a better understanding of best and worst case as well. So for this problem, let's begin by trying to determine what would the best case runtime be. This algorithm is a sequential search algorithm. You're given an array and its size, and you're looking for some value k within that array. We do that by iterating over the array and checking if a at the given index is equal to k. If so, we return the correct index. If no such index exists, then we return negative 1 to let the user know. So what is the best case runtime? The best case runtime here would be if the very first value of the array was equal to k. So best case is that a 1 is equal to k. If that happened, that for loop would run once and it would immediately return. This would take constant time. t of n would then be in theta of 1. What about the worst case? The worst case here is that we run through this for loop over and over and over and over and over and over again and never find k, and after we've run through the entire for loop, we need to get down here to this bottom return statement. So the worst case is that k is not in a. What would that mean? Well, this for loop runs n times, and the cost of one run is constant, so it would be in theta of n. Notice that the best case and the worst case are not the same. So then a natural question would be, yeah, that might be the worst case and that might be the best case, but what do we actually get when we run it? Do we actually have some sort of idea of how long does it take on average, or how long can we expect it to take? That is the question we're going to try to answer. So to answer that, we're going to need to use a little bit of probability, and we're going to need to make some assumptions. So I'm going to assume that k is in a. Why do we make this assumption? It makes the analysis a lot easier because if we didn't know that k was in there, we would need to have some notion of what is the likelihood that k is within the array. In practice, you might know this, but for our purposes, we're just going to assume that k is within the array and that all positions have equal likelihood of containing k and we're going to assume a has no duplicates. The assuming it has no duplicates is convenient for ha having mutually exclusive conditions. We don't want that there are potentially four copies of k and we need to figure out which one is the first to occur. I will mention that there are other ways we could have worded some of this. In particular, I said here that all positions have equal likelihood of containing k. A better way to word that might be that all permutations of a are equally likely. So we'll try to use that in the future. That's a little more mathematically rigorous way of saying it. A permutation meaning, meaning a rearrangement of the elements. So, with these assumptions in mind, we're going to try to do this in a very raw probability way, which is we're going to make a little table that I have down here, and we're going to say what is the likelihood of the event, the probability of it, and how long would it take to run the algorithm if that were to occur. So we already know some of this information without doing any probability at all. How long would it take if k was in the first slot? It would need to run the for loop once. So that would be constant time. If it was in the second slot, it would need to run the for loop twice. If it was in the third slot, it would be three times. 
then four times. If it was in the n minus first slot, it would need to go through it n minus one times. If it was in the nth slot, it would need to go through it n times. And then if it is not in a, it would run through the for loop all n times, and then it would also need to do that final return statement. So what is the probability of each of those events? This is where our assumptions come in critically important. We made all of these assumptions to make that probability convenient. If all permutations are equally likely, and we know k must be in the array, we can actually nail down those probabilities. There are n locations in the array, and it must be in one of them. And if all of them are equally likely, the probability it is in one of n is one divided by n. So this probability would be one over n there, one over n there, one over n there, one over n there, one over n, and one over n. And the probability of k is not an a is zero. We assumed that probability away. We could then, if we made different assumptions, have different facts about that probability, and that can change our analysis. So if we're trying to find the expected runtime, the expected runtime, e for expected value, on an array of size n, well, in order to find the expected runtime, we can add up the probability of each of the runtimes times the time it requires. We can add up all of the runtimes, which I'm going to use the letter Q here. The runtime, let's use a lowercase t, runtime, assuming that A at position Q is equal to K times the probability that a at position Q is equal to K. And our table tells us those values. If we look at our table, the probabilities are all 1 over N. So let's do that. All of those are 1 over N. And the probability, or sorry, and the time it requires at position Q, let's look at our pattern we have. If it was at position 1, it took 1 times C. Position 2, 2 times C. Position three, three times C, position four, four times C. That pattern extrapolates through all of the values. So the runtime, if it is at position Q, is Q times C. So let's analyze that summation off to the side over here. The expected runtime is the sum from Q equals one to N of C times Q times one over N. Let's pull the one over N out of the summation. Sum from Q equals one to N. And while we're at it, let, why not pull out the C, which is also a constant, has nothing to do with our summation index. Now we now have an arithmetic summation. We're adding up one plus two plus three all the way up until N. And that converges to n times n plus 1 over 2. We get a little bit of simplification here. And we get c times n plus 1 over 2. For this particular problem, you might not find that too surprising. That is roughly n over 2. And... If you have no clue where in the array k might fall, it might make sense that on average it would take about half of the time because it might end up somewhere in the middle. Your intuition might fail you with probability, so you do need to be careful, but sometimes it's nice to have those checks. So with that in mind, our expected time, e t of n, our expected case runtime, e t of n, is in theta of n. It is the same as the worst case for this problem. That is not always the case, but in this situation it happened to be. This idea of computing the time it takes for each input, each possibility, and then computing the probability of each of those possibilities is the foundation for how we're going to do expected runtime. We will see in future videos the formal definitions of what we're doing, and we will apply this to several different algorithms 
in this section.